on our latest and greatest OAUG, Young Professionals Forum conference call today. We are going to be talking about the cloud, which is a very hot topic right now, and we've got an awesome presentation for you. I saw a sneak peek yesterday, and you are going to love it. So before we get started, I want to ask everyone, um, do you have any questions or concerns? Send me those during the broadcast in the question box, and I will save those for the end or be able to help you with any difficulties you might be having with our technology. Um, and I want to remind you, if you are not dialed in on a landline or cell phone, if you would take a moment and dial in that way, it will certainly help us cut down on any extra sound. And with no further ado, I will turn it over to Keaton, our board advisor and liaison. Keaton, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about uh, the cloud, obviously. But before we uh, start with the presentation, I have a few um, updates to make. So um, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, uh, those who are interested in submitting uh, your presentation for Collaborate 2015, uh, October to, uh, 10th, which is this Friday, is the last day before you can submit your presentation. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's just an abstract with about uh, less than 500 words and three objectives that you submit um, as of now. So if you have any interesting topic or anything that you would like to share with the other Oracle product users, uh, this is your opportunity to, uh, to submit a presentation. And if your presentation gets accepted, uh, remember that you get a free ride or a free entry to the conference. So that's always a good incentive to um, not only submit a presentation, but also uh, share the information that um, you have learned or um, experienced over the number of years. Um, the best of uh, 2014 uh, co collaborate our you know webinars are still ongoing. So when you get a chance, uh, visit OAUG's website and sign up for some of those presentations that might be of interest to you. Um, and a lot of them are recorded sessions, so you can you can basically review them anytime. Um, the registration for Collaborate 2015, which again this year is also going to be in Las Vegas, is going to open soon. And um, the benefit that uh, the member organizations have is they get some steep discounts. Uh, on the registration fee. So if any of you are uh, members of OAUG uh, or your companies are members of OAUG, you will get a huge discount when you sign up for registration to the Collaborate 2015. If you are not, we would strongly encourage you to uh, become members. Uh, other than some of the content that's available on OAUG, you also get some of these additional discounts as part of uh, different conferences that we hold hold through the year. Um, the Board of Directors elections closes tonight, so if your organization um, has not voted, um, the, the ambassador from your organization is the only one who can vote. So if you're a member of OAUG and your ambassador has not voted, I would strongly encourage you to remind them to uh, vote uh, before midnight tonight. Um, as, as I was saying, there's a lot of membership uh, discounts available. So if your company is not already a member of OAUG, I'd strongly encourage you to talk to your IT folks or the folks from your business and get them to uh, sign up. There are some um, discounted rates available um, as we speak, so you might want to make use of those uh, rates that are available. There's also a connection point uh, coming up, and this time, the connection point is going to focus on Hyperion, um, and that's from November 17th to 19th. So this is another conference where you could sign up uh, at the discounted rate and attend the uh, conference and uh, get information about Hyperion if you or your company is using or planning to use Hyperion uh, products. There's ambassador webinars coming up on October 21st. There are two sessions, so you can sign up for any one of those. There's an orientation webinar coming coming up on 14th as well. And uh, lastly, if you're interested in any in uh, serving on any committee of OAUG, please send an email to Anna. Uh, the email address is on the uh, on the slide up here. 
and um, also check out some of these uh, tasks and activities that each of these committees perform for OAUG. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the two speakers uh, for today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, first one is going to be Ravi. Uh, Ravi has been working with Apps Associates for a number of years, and uh, he's been a um, he, he's basically a solution architect, but he's got a lot of experience with cloud and cloud provided services. Got um, uh, several years of experience with EBS as well as um, um, cloud technology, and then he's also worked with uh, Hitachi, which was which is now acquired by. Um, which was originally a say, Atlantic company, it's now acquired by Hitachi. So was prior to that, he was working for Hitachi. And then he's uh, worked on multiple uh, enterprise customers providing cloud uh, advisory services. And uh, also got an implementation experience on Oracle products. Uh, the next speaker is going to be uh, Brian. And Brian is with Southern Company. He's a technical architect there. Um, and uh, He's also part of the Oracle Solutions Center of Excellence. He's uh, been with the Southern Company for over nine years, and overall he's got 15 years of experience with EBS. Um, he's been uh, an implementation consultant with IBM and PwC, and uh, has worked on technical and functional positions in the past. And uh, currently he's working on uh, developing the strategy for cloud adoption for Southern Company. So with that uh, introduction, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ravi for uh, his portion of the presentation. OK. Thank you, Ketan. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this particular webinar. I hope you all can hear me OK. I take it yes. OK, uh, here is the brief agenda for us today. We have, we'll begin with what is cloud first, and then we'll move into more details about this particular cloud. So let's understand what exactly is cloud. This is the definition provided by NIST standards guys who defined cloud as a service which is convenient, on demand, shared pool of resources that can be rapidly provisioned with minimum effort or service provider interaction. I just highlighted those buzzwords here because when we're talking about cloud, one of the more, most important driver here is we want something on demand in a convenient way. We don't want to wait for purchasing approvals, hardware procurements, data center space, and all those waiting periods are avoided in this particular cloud. So the most important aspect of cloud is having something available on demand. Whenever I need it, I have, it has to be available. And in a convenient way, it, it should not be so complex to request something. And the other main aspect of this cloud is from a shared pool of configurable computing resources. When we say shared pool, the goal here is if I need a particular server, I don't want something bought for me specifically, which increases the cost. The main driver for cloud is increase overall utilization and also make it convenient while doing this particular uh, uh, you know consolidation of our resources so when we are having this particular shared pool it is important that we need to know that this shared pool, shared pool of resources is configurable to my specific workload i don't want cloud provider to dictate how i should run my services it has to be configurable to my workloads from a shared pool. And all this complexity should allow me to do it in a rapid provisioning process. Obviously, there is complexity involved. If it takes me months 
to get such a resource, it's not worth it. So again, this has to be a rapidly provisioned service. And on top of all these things, it has to be minimal effort to manage so that I can focus on the real work that I'm going to do rather than actually managing the platform as such. So this is the overall definition of what exactly is cloud. Let's move to next slide. Yeah, but what exactly is characteristics of this particular cloud? First one is on-demand self-service. As I mentioned, it has to be something if I need a resource, I should be able to provision it. I should not go through a another third party to get it done. It has to be self-service for me and I should get it right away. Next thing is, this has to be available over a broad network access. When I say broad network access, uh, if we take a step back of how computing resources were available to us traditionally, each organization used to have a data center or a colo facility or even a server room within their building where they have computing resources, let it be a server or an application or a application platform. All these services were available within that particular company's network so that they can access it over a VPN or direct network access in that particular office premises. When we are talking about cloud, obviously this is not sitting in our office. It is somewhere else, somewhere managed by the cloud provider, which could be within the country or in a different continent altogether. So those environments should be accessible to me over the public network so that I can access it conveniently without compromising the security, of course. We need to have it in an easily accessible network way. I mean, this has to be broad network access. And another essential characteristic of this particular cloud service should be, it should pool the resources. The main driver here is it will increase the utilization of the service. You know, overall underlying hard architecture or hardware or disk or whatever it is, if I pool the resources, I'll get better utilization and it will drive down the cost for me. This has to be one more important characteristic. And this is one of the most important aspect of cloud is it has to be elastic. What I mean by elastic is today I am supporting a user base of 100 users. Tomorrow if I make an acquisition or add more number of users, my application that is running on cloud should be able to support that additional 100 users immediately without too much of modifications, without too much of lead time, I should be able to support them rapidly. This rapid uh, elasticity could be a couple of hours, couple of days. Obviously, it should not be weeks or months. It has to be immediately available for us to scale up those resources and access those particular uh, increased capacity and serve the new user base. And the most important characteristic is we are saying that this is on demand, pool resources and elastic, but I need to know what I'm using. I need to measure the services that are being made available to you, how much I'm utilizing and report back on it. Whether I'm paying it or I'm just seeing it, it's a different story, but I need to know what exactly I'm using. These are the five major characteristics of any cloud computing technology. These are the standards most widely uh, accepted standard characteristics. There could be more, but these are the minimum things that we should expect from a cloud computing uh, technology as such. So fine, there are some definitions and characteristics. So what exactly is the benefit? I'll get out of 
putting my workload or running an application on this cloud computing. The first and foremost is no upfront capital expense. Just imagine a new startup trying to launch their product. They have this beautiful application they would like to take to the user base. The first thing they need to do is they have an idea they will implement it. But to host it and run it they need a big data center, security provisions, connectivity and all those things. All these components are capital expense. To begin with he, uh, the company has to put in some kind of money on the table to build the entire infrastructure. That is what a traditional model is. But with cloud computing I don't invest in all those things. I don't have to put in any capital expense to begin with and I'll have my infrastructure readily available. That's one of the benefit. Next one is overall cost should come down. Low cost is a you know it's a kind of gray area. Low cost compared to what is the main question. When we are trying to leverage cloud computing the most important factor is we should see what is the total cost of ownership for this particular cloud computing service. If you try to compare apples to apples on an on-premise uh, location the way we run traditionally, we will have data centers, network infrastructure, IT personnel, network engineers, servers, storage, backups, and all those things. All these components need some kind of investment let it be one time or ongoing and there is always end of life for each of these components. You have a server there is end of life within five years. You have to buy a new one after five years. So each of the component has a cost associated with it. That's the overall cost for that particular solution. If you try to compare it with cloud computing model, you don't worry about these end of lives, data centers, security technologies and even the administrator personnel to handle the racking and stacking of all the servers. This will drive down overall cost if you try to accumulate all these considerations. Of course, there is a consideration wherein I represent an organization where we already have hundreds of servers running in our Colo facility. We have all the servers running, we have IT personnel already, we have data center space, we have power and cooling and everything. All we need is just an extra server. In that case, you might not see exact low cost, but if you try to put all the components together, you will drive down the cost over a period of time. That is one of the major benefit. This is the best part of cloud is you only pay for what you use. If you need a development environment for one week, you pay for that one week, do your development and get rid of it. You have a new idea that you would like to implement, try it out. If it works, fine, take it to production. If it doesn't work, get rid of the servers no damage that you have to carry on. You are paying only for what you are using and you are not living with that particular expense throughout the lifetime of that particular uh, database or a server or an application as such. So you pay only for what you use and you can easily succeed or if you fail with that particular idea you don't have a damage to deal with. That's another benefit. And the fourth one is self-service. It is available for you as a self-service thing. Click a button, you get a server. As simple as that. Another thing, we have this big resource pool of services that are easily available to use. So you can easily scale up and scale down. Assume you have a website traffic, an e-commerce site that would require more capacity during the holiday weekend. At that time, you can throw in 10 more web servers or app servers handle the load. Once the holiday weekend goes down, user traffic comes down, remove those servers. 
easily scale up and scale down and you will only pay for that extra capacity for that particular weekend, not throughout the year. That's another advantage. And the most important thing is agility and better time to market for your products. Just imagine how much time uh, you might have allocated for uh, take any implementation project, let's say. Uh, there is a Oracle Business Suite implementation project. In the implementation timeline, first one month will be allocated for hardware procurement and installations. Just imagine that you are going to replace that one month with one week, saying that provision Oracle Business Suite on cloud. Suddenly your projects complete faster, your, your products will go to market more quickly, there is better time to market value and your entire development team is more agile. You need a couple of additional environments for your testing a new product or a new functionality, quickly spin up a new test environment and test it. This will make the overall IT operations more agile, which in turn makes business more agile to respond to the events. So these are the major benefits. Now let's take a look at what are the models uh, available here. This is what we used to have all these days, on-premise infrastructure. We have everything managed by us. Us means could be the in-house personnel or there's a data center provider doing it for you or there is a separate shared services team at the corporate level doing it for you. But overall, you are paying for all these services, you are managing it. Networks, storage, servers, you know, virtualizations, operating systems, databases, middlewares and applications and everything. It's all available for you but managed by you. The next, the most important cloud service model is infrastructure as service. These are the buzzwords that we are hearing, you know, infrastructure as service is one of the more prominent uh, cloud service model. In this service model, there is a cloud service provider who will provide us the bottom four components. He will provide us with networking, he will provide storage, servers and he will he'll pre-build that particular virtualization layer, let it be something like VMware or Oracle VM, that virtualization layer is built and managed by the provider and available for you. What you have in your control is from the guest operating system onwards. You would like to install a Linux server or a Windows server, put a database on it or application server on it. It's all installed and managed by you. This is the model of infrastructure as service, where you are getting the infrastructure components till virtualization, above which is your responsibility. Next model of cloud service delivery is platform as service. You might say, okay, fine, uh, if cloud provider can give me till virtualization layer and all I am doing is a Java application development. I don't want to think about the operating system and JVMs. I want to have a readily usable JVM, let's say. If that is what your requirement is, platform as a service is best. In this case, cloud service provider will give you a readily configurable runtime engine. Compare it with Oracle's Java as a service. Their service is, all you have to do is, I need a application server which can run a Java application. I'll provide the var file and all the configuration settings. Oracle will take care of all the infrastructure, OS settings and everything below, the, below that particular Java layer. It's all taken care of by them. You have a application server platform to run. Similarly, a database service. I don't want to install databases and do the backups and recoveries. All I need is a schema to store my data. Request a database as a service platform, which is a platform as a service component. You request for a database schema, you get the schema, start using it, 
build applications on top of it. It's all platform as a service. And the final service model here is software as service. You might say that, okay, all I need is a ERP software, which can help me to do manage my HCM workload. I want to manage the hiring, hire to terminate cycle, recruit to terminate. I want to do entire HR operations in the cloud. I don't want to manage the servers. I don't want to manage the application servers. And I don't want to manage that application configurations as such as well. All we need is a fully baked software. This is software as service. All you request is, I need HCM for 10 users. You get 10 users login. It's all available for you. They will take care of all updates to it. They will make sure that it is latest on the software releases. They will patch it. They will back it up. They will ensure the availability and monitor it. Everything is taken care by the provider. So as you can see, these four models, the first one is the on-premise model, traditional model. But in each of these models, there is a gradual progress in what we manage as an end user and what a cloud service provider will manage. So depending on our requirement, how much control we need, we can choose one of these models. Just examples of those particular services, you know, infrastructure as service, there are many providers out there. Amazon Web Services, one of the first one to start this particular service back in 2006. They came a long way, but they are not alone. So many other players joined. Google, Microsoft Azure, and Oracle is not far behind too. Oracle launched their infrastructure as service offering in a preview mode in recent open world. Uh, this is one of the major announcements in uh, Keynote there. So Oracle has this infrastructure as service as well. When it comes to platform as service, there are quite a few providers. Salesforce, one of the major force.com platform for your developments. And there are quite a few other platforms from Oracle. Database service, Java service, messaging service, integration service. You name the business requirement, most likely they will have a platform to develop that particular uh, application or a workload for you. And the final delivery model example, software as service, there are a bunch from uh, uh, Oracle. In fact, this is one of the most common delivery model you will hear in the market. Almost each and every product development company making their product in a software as service model. Oracle has almost all enterprise products available in SaaS model. Let it be the Fusion Apps or cloud applications, what we used to call, to the business intelligence cloud service, Hyperion planning and budgeting service. All these services are, or softwares are available in a software as service model. All you need to do is, I want to use my planning application, request for one Oracle P planning and budgeting cloud service, and you have Hyperion environment. No installations, nothing. You have an environment to start developing your applications and use it. Similarly, from other providers, we have Salesforce, one of the com popular, in fact, market leader in CRM uh, SaaS offerings. And when it comes to back office, Office 365, the emails and uh, instant messaging, conferencing, all these services are available as a software as service model. These are some examples. It's not a comprehensive list, and there are more products being released every day. Okay, so we have so far discussed like what are the cloud services, how they work, you know, what are the characteristics, what are the benefits, what are the models. But let's take a look at how exactly they are deployed these days. The first and foremost option is private cloud. Many large organizations have implemented this and they have excelled in this particular service offering. Uh, just consider a pretty large scale uh, multinational operation like let's take GE and they have like hundreds of 
internal business units and groups they need infrastructure if they would like to consolidate everything they will build their own data center and provide it as a private cloud service to internal business units and users in this is a private cloud model where you have full control you have control of infrastructure data centers and everything but the end users within your organization will not see this complexities so within the organization the IT department will manage this private cloud but the end users won't see all these complexities and they are available in a more of elastic and secure uh, paper use kind of model where they can have internal chargeback mechanisms so all the benefits of cloud available within your organization within your own control that is more like a private cloud offering if you try to take example Oracle has released some of these uh, engineered systems like virtual compute units and uh, Excel logic boxes all these engineered systems if they are deployed in your central data center you can provide these database as service Java as service or even infrastructure as service models within your organization in more elastic and self-service way again this private cloud is not a typical way of uh, you know there's IT team you request for a server they will get back in one week that's not it this private cloud is more of a self service even though it is installed within your organization you request for it you get it immediately using that self service consoles so that's private cloud public cloud is complete opposite of it it's somewhere sitting out there we don't know where exactly it is the data center is all they say is it's in east coast virginia let's say amazon has a data center in virginia nobody knows the exact location but you request for a service they will provide it completely managed by the provider they have full control you have control of only what you provision you request for a server you have control of the server nothing more and the third model is hybrid cloud it is more of a mix of private and public we'll see it in a minute what exactly hybrid cloud you have your data center you extend it to various public providers what you can do with that extension you can run some workloads in one data centers other in remaining or you can integrate them with more integration points that's more like a hybrid cloud extension to your own data center so about roadmap how exactly you'd consider about building a roadmap Brian will discuss in this uh, in more detail but let me give a brief high level stuff here first you need to identify what are my applications what should I move to cloud whether it is email or my ERP or my analytics what is my application then assess the needs what exactly it requires what kind of network storage compute it requires and then you identify where to move should I move it to a public cloud or a private cloud or a platform as service or should I completely do it more like a SaaS based offering you do that and then finally you consider a migration approach we'll touch that particular migrate process in a slide next slide but you repeat this particular cycle for each and every application and that's more like a phase by phase approach for your client migration you can find more details in the particular white paper link available here actual migration process is uh, pretty much straightforward uh, it is typical to any other project I would say you first assess what exactly am, am I moving here and what vendor choices are available there are hundreds of choices available which one should we move then you do build a pilot do a proof of concept migrate it see if it works and then do the real migration of your uh, application workload 
and don't stop there. There are many features available only in the cloud, not in on-premise environments. So make sure you tune it to leverage the cloud capabilities, optimize it to maximize your investment and enhance your applications and user service by leveraging more and more services. So that's a typical way of migrating. From Oracle point of view, as we mentioned earlier, Oracle has services in each of these three layers, IAS, infrastructure as a service, a lot of options, compute, storage and messaging, storage is publicly available, others are in preview, platform as a service, database and Java are available for you to use today itself, few are in limited preview, few are in available only to specific uh, customers, you can check with your Oracle sales rep to try them out and software as service, most of them are in public, uh, publicly available. Uh, there are many options by Oracle wherein you can migrate your existing uh, ERP to a cloud-based ERP using a coexistence and uh, integration-based approach. So various products out there. Uh, I know we are running a little short of time here. Uh, let me hand it over to Brian. Brian? All yes. Hello, Brian? Brian, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Anna, can you check uh, his access? Yes, it looks like Brian is just getting situated, everybody. Just one more second. Sorry about that delay, everyone. No problem. Okay. All right. Hey, this is Brian. It looks like we had some uh, audio difficulties. So, Ravi, thank you for taking the time to walk everybody through what the cloud is and uh, how you might move to the cloud. Uh, I'm going to talk from a, a different standpoint of why would you choose to go to the cloud and, and maybe a little bit more of the business perspective and as a, uh, as a company that that already has a number of apps that are uh, a number of usage of uh, cloud providers, mostly as software as a service. How did we get there and why? And and then what's based on our strategy, what do we see, uh, where do we see value in the cloud, and why would we choose to use the cloud? So moving on. So the first slide I have is uh, business drivers for cloud adoption. So these are based on uh, interviewing our, our business partners and, and working through the folks that are already in the cloud um, at Southern Company. These are the main drivers that came up again and again for why uh, business units chose to use cloud services. One of the first ones is that that's where their vendors went. So vendors in some cases only offer cloud services. In some cases they offer both on-premise or cloud and give you the option. Uh, the second one goes back to one of the benefits Ravi said before, so flexibility and agility, the, the ability to move quickly and also to, to scale up and scale down. Um, another one is desire for business unit independence. So in some cases, um, some business units don't always like to rely on IT uh, in-house, and that was, was one reason that, that came up. Another reason is that 
cloud solutions have been growing in maturity, and so there's a, a level of comfort that goes with that as well. And also, you know that, that with maturity comes stability and additional security as well. Uh, Ravi also mentioned earlier that you're only paying for what you're using. Um, so the, the example there is that if you're building out a system in-house, you need to make sure that you can handle the peak workload. If you're using a cloud service or a hybrid service, what you can do is have it set up to handle your normal workload, but then when you know you're going to have a peak, uh, peak time, that you scale up to handle that peak demand. So an example is um, maybe every two weeks your company sends out an email that says your pay, avail pay information is available, click on this link. The other, you know, the other 13 days or the other nine business days, people aren't going to have that same level of demand. But when that uh, email about your paycheck comes out, people are going to click on that and need access to those resource resources. Um, also, with uh, cloud services allow you to focus on your core competencies. So you focus on the things that drive value in your business, not necessarily things that everybody does at every company. So things like Office 365 for, is, is an example here, um, that you don't need to manage all of your Office products in-house. You may not need to manage SharePoint in-house, things like that. Um, data center utilization, so if you already do have a data center in-house, you can slow the growth of that and or avoid the need to uh, to procure additional data centers or additional space. Um, Ravi also hit on time to market, so that's another another big driver. And then since it is on the cloud, uh, mobility is another driver, so it's not necessarily contained within the four walls of your organization. So the, avail the availability to get to those resources on your mobile devices. So from our Southern Company's evaluation of the cloud, these were kind of our high-level takeaways on, on what we thought about the cloud. So we did feel that cloud solutions provided benefits that justified a process for us to develop to evaluate whether a business need fits the cloud. Um, we felt that that process should be triple, simple and transparent, um, minimize the number of hoops that, that your users need to jump through in order to evaluate a, a business need for the cloud. Um, the next bullet point, uh, external cloud solutions pose significant legal and compliance concerns that must be evaluated. What, what it really means is that going to the cloud is not necessarily a technical decision, because we know we can do it technically. And, and you go through pilots, and, and you learn through those efforts as well. But, but the ultimately, your decision on whether you're going to put a business need in the cloud um, is a business decision around level of risk. Um, are there specific uh, regulatory requirements that you need to consider? Um, is the application or, or solution business critical? Um, how much access do you need to the data? There's a lot of different factors that go into your decision-making process. Um, data classification is key to assuring the protection of your assets. And you know, I, I think this is where you make a decision around what type of data you have and whether you're comfortable with putting that with a cloud provider. And, and in most cases, I'm talking about a public cloud provider. If you're doing it in-house, private cloud, you, you don't really have to consider that as much. But do you have data, for example, that is publicly available? Do you have data that provides your company a competitive advantage? Is that something that you want to keep in-house? Um, do you have data that meets regulations such as Sarbanes-Oxley or HIPAA about your employees? Um, so those are the kinds of, of evaluation of data that you need to do before you make a decision to move to the cloud. And then the last point is that uh, about your resources, making sure that they're ready to support cloud solutions uh, from a business standpoint and from brokering and, and uh, working with vendors and, and the providers to, to uh, use cloud to support your business needs. So the, the three main areas that we evaluated uh, as far as cloud goes are service, security, and reliability. And I, I think that same, those same buckets apply when you're evaluating a vendor um, for whether you want to use them for their services. So as far as service goes, um, there's, we want to make sure they're dynamically scalable and configurable, like we said, the time to market and transparent and flexible pricing models. So 
Uh, Ravi mentioned earlier that cloud um, could potentially be lower cost. We didn't always find that to be the case. Um, in our evaluation, sometimes the in-house solution is cheaper. Um, but you have to be able to compare apples to apples, like he said. And so um, I'll get to, uh, on, on a future slide, we'll talk about how to do that, um, how to be able to compare apples to apples on that. As far as security, so data ownership, control, and assurance. Um, data ownership is, whoops, somebody changed it on me. Um, data ownership, control, and assurance. Um, one question there is geographic zoning. Uh, we have some regulatory requirements, uh, particularly for nuclear data, that says that it has to be housed in the United States. And so that's an important part of, of evaluation um, you want to make sure that they meet all the security certifications. Um, you need to know what the remediation process is in the event of a breach, so that goes to contractual assurances. Um, also known that in encryption, integrity, availability, that the applications will be hosted securely. And then the last bullet point there is about auditability of the security controls and processes. So. Some of the factors that came up there are who has physical access to the data center um, and what, you know, do you have the ability to go send somebody to audit that, that data center and audit the processes that are in place and the security controls that are in place? And then reliability, um, you have to make sure that you're comfortable with the service level agreements that you get from the provider, that you're able to get disaster recovery, that you're able to meet performance benchmarks. Is your service that you're going to get over, you know, over the internet, is that going to be sufficient for what your business needs? And then in the event that their primary center goes down, what's your recovery process? So these are the areas now, the, the critical success factors. These are the ones that we felt um, were most important in the strategy about whether to adopt clouds. The first one, which I mentioned before, is billing transparency. And the two different models that we talk about in-house are showback and chargeback. Um, at, at Southern Company, I think there's a number of costs that, that aren't always clear to the business, and storage is, was one good example of that. And so in order to really show your business units the full cost of ownership, you would have to implement um, at least a showback model in order to show them, you know, in order to have eBusiness Suite, these are all the different um, costs that make up that, that full bucket so that you can compare the full cost to what is uh, provided by a cloud provider. We already talked a little bit about data classification. Um, communication and awareness is, as you can tell from the fact that we have a, a great number of people on this call, I don't think a lot of folks in the, on the business side really have a good understanding of, of what cloud is and the benefits that it can provide. And so internally we had talked about standing up a, a cloud portal and having people be cloud champions to help educate and raise awareness across the company. Um, we also talked about mobility, so that provides access to information from any platform. Um, one thing Ravi, I guess, didn't really mention is personal cloud. And so there's a number of different things out there. Some of them are just for personal use, some of them are for corporate use. Um, Dropbox, Google Docs, um, at Southern Company they use a tool called AirWatch to help manage uh, company information that may be on your personal devices. It does bring up some privacy concerns and, and some folks just aren't comfortable with that and are, are making the decision to either not have company information on their personal device, maybe they get a second device or maybe they just live without having work email on their phones. But, uh, but having a strategy for how to deal with personal cloud I think is important because if you don't have a solution there, then what people end up doing is sometimes a less secure solution, such as potentially sending confidential pers you know, uh, company documents by email to themselves. Um, we also felt that it's, it's very important to have a streamlined contract and legal evaluation process. Um, I, and I think this one goes hand in hand with data classification. If you are able to classify your data in a way that you're able to communicate the risk that's inherent with that data, the less risky things can go through a much shorter, much streamlined contract and legal process 
whereas the things that are more, more need more um, eyes on them or, or more analysis, that those you're able to take more time and, and dedicate that to the legal process for those, and not every business need, but only the ones that really need it. And then lastly, um, a lot of times when you're evaluating a cloud need, you're looking at just the security aspects of it and not necessarily how easy is the uh, solution to use. So we feel that it's important to do to evaluate both security and ease of use. So this is the last slide that I have, and, and this is really just to kind of give you a, a feel for the transition moving from in prem, you know, on on site, on premise solutions to supporting cloud. And there, the article referenced at the bottom by Joe McKendrick had eight important skills needed for cloud, and that came from Forbes. Um, Southern Company actually added a ninth one at the bottom around metrics and analytics. Um, once that cloud solution is in place. But, but those skills are, are business and financial skills, so building a business case, being able to uh, build a return on investment, um, and then the technical skills. And so the, the technical skills in some ways change, particularly for infrastructure folks that work in-house. Um, there's a lot more transition over to standardization, um, and and less you know less old world skills and and really making sure that the technical skills are ready to do to do cloud. Um, the development world is is has been changing, but um, what the what this article references is is Java and .NET framework skills may come to the forefront and knowledge of virtualization. So a, a lot of open source, a lot of standardization is is the focus there and then working through some of the others, enterprise architecture, business needs analysis, project management, we already talked about uh, contract and vendor negotiation, uh, security and compliance, that piece gets a lot more complicated, especially if you have a hybrid solution where some of it's in-house and some of it's out-of-house uh, with, with a cloud provider. Um, data integration and analysis, um, one thing that I, I think we didn't hit on earlier was one thing to evaluate when you're moving to the cloud is what's the level of integration between the solution that you're moving to the cloud and other systems that you may have in-house or, or with another cloud provider. That integration piece becomes a lot more complicated if you're trying to integrate multiple systems across multiple clouds with multiple providers. So the, those skill sets become more and more important. And then mobile application development and management is the last one. And that's just the, with the rise of mobility, and, and we already hit on the benefits of cloud and being able to access them from mobile devices. So that pretty much wraps up the uh, the prepared presentation. Um, at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Anna to uh, share any questions that may have come up. Awesome. Thank you, Brian and Ravi. Um, to all of our participants, if you have any questions, if you will take a second and type those into the question box for me. Um, I will read those to Brian and Ravi and get their feedback on that. And um, I saw a few come in and actually had a few beforehand. Um, Brian, but I know you talked about migrating to the cloud. Is that something, um, how long, if you can answer that, did that take you guys, or how long is a normal transition time to go comfortably from what you have to the cloud in a way that you feel like everything is, is secure. Well, no, I'll address that. The, the, so most of the stuff that we already have in the cloud is mostly software as a service, um, which means that the provider handles most everything. Um, for a lot of the apps, our preferred um, authentication method is, is what we call a hosted redirect, where um, the cloud provider actually redirects them to our site for authentication and login we provide the credentials back to the cloud provider and then they take it from there. Um, that, that effort is, is fairly minimal um, to stand up with a, with a cloud provider. Uh, obviously, the first one maybe is a little longer, but, but once that, that stuff is in place, then it, it's easier to leverage going forward. Um, we did do a pilot um, with one of our IT applications 
and it, it did actually prove the first time to be more challenging, but I, I think I think some of that is just learning curve and and the more you do it, the, the more comfortable you're going to be. And, and Ravi may be able to, to give some examples of some customers that he's worked with as far as timeline on, on their migrations. Ravi? Yeah, sure, Brian. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Yes, OK. Um, migration, uh, of course, uh, it depends on uh, two major aspects. Uh, first one is uh, the integration. Uh, components with that particular application that you are trying to move and second thing is uh, the testing that you have uh, stabilized internally so if you have all the test processes and testing tools ready to validate the application on the cloud uh, this becomes a kind of smooth process and in terms of integrations if you have everything documented and readily available to use then it's easier uh, these two are the major components that we have seen as the major time-consuming processes within cloud migration project. But if you're trying to move a already stabilized product to infrastructure as platform, for example, think of it as any other data center migration project. It is no different from that. From that. So typically, depending on the application, three to six months is the most common timelines for a small to medium complex application. If it is a pretty complex one, then again, it could go a little longer depending on the integrations and uh, testing phase that you have to engage. Okay, thank you. And I um, have just one or two more questions, and then we've got to wrap it up. Um, it sounds like, based on the presentation today, data classification is really a key part of the security that you mentioned. Brian, and can you go back and say one more time all of the people or the key departments or whoever it was that you wrapped into that discussion to make sure everything was classified correctly and, and thereby secure? So data classification is, is going to kind of be its own area, but as far as the folks, that the different types of groups that need to be involved, um, you do need your legal and compliance team and or internal controls to be comfortable with what um, what type of data um, you're considering for a, a cloud solution um, and just to give some examples that I think I talked through is the is it business critical is it is it data that's within the realm of a regulatory agency so in our case uh, FERC or NERC so those are energy um, regulatory agencies is it nuclear is it uh, personally uh, identifiable information? Does it fall under HIPAA? Is it SOX, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, financial data? Um, but I would say you, you typically have um, your business users involved uh, to, to help class, classify that data, internal controls, your legal and compliance, and then you, you always want to have uh, your IT folks involved as well. Um, and whatever those classification standards are, you want to make sure that you have those applied consistently across the organization. So data classification itself, if, if you've done a good job of that at your company already, then it, I think it streamlines and simplifies your process for evaluating a business need for the cloud. Okay, thank you. Um, and it looks like we are just a little bit over time, so everybody else, um, if you have any more questions, um, if you would email them to me, um, I will be happy to put you in touch with Ravi and Brian so they can answer your questions directly. And I will post this recording on our website, on the Young Professionals page later this week, so that you can go back. Um, and review it again or reach out directly to them if you have any questions. But we want to say a huge, huge thank you to Brian and Ravi for doing this presentation today. I know they worked so hard on it, and it um, has been really great, especially with all the cloud information we heard last week at Oracle Open World. So thank you to our presenters, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please check out the um, professional page later this week, and make sure to save the date. December 10th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will have our next Young Professionals call, and we will be discussing three lessons I wish I had learned earlier in my career. We will do that with Julie Ma of Google, Pat Dews from the City of Las Vegas, 
Wade Lewis from George Fisher Plastics. And all of that information is also on our webpage. Thank you all so much for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of the day.